this new year. Um, anyone in this room, New Year's resolution people? Yeah? Someone said yeah. New Year's resolutions, no? Anybody? Raise your hand if you have a New Year's resolution. <laughs> okay, there's more than I thought. You're, I didn't have much hope. This is going to fall flat. So about a quarter of all of Americans, just like you who raised your hand, are on day two of their journey of change, of new change, the new year, the new you. Um, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. Actually, I kind of do because I'm not much of a New Year's resolution person. Uh, but I looked up some statistics on the amount of people that stick with their resolutions, and I found through very, very scientific discovery that 64% of all people who uh, form a New Year's resolution lose their resolve and they abandon their resolution within the first month, okay? So within the first month, 64, a mass majority of people will abandon the New Year's resolutions. Hopefully you're not one of those people, um, but I am one of those people and that's why I'm using this scientific fact to not make a New Year's resolution this year because I don't wanna be a statistic um, I'd, pr I'd rather be in that minority of people that they, they don't keep their New Year's resolution because they don't make one. Um, New Year's resolutions offer an opportunity for us to look at something really superficial and say, I want to change that about me. It's an opportunity to maybe lose some weight. Um, after the guilt of the holiday season, eating too much lefsa, if you're Scandinavian or whatever, whatever else you guys ate too much of over uh, Christmas and New Year, uh, maybe lose weight through exercise. You want to you exercise a little bit more. Um, you could maybe even be something good like spend more time with family, be nicer. Um, but most of the time, if we're honest with ourselves, when we want to change, our change is pretty superficial. Amen? Can I get an amen about that? Most of the change that we kind of, we focus on is external things that don't really matter. They may, I'm, it's, it doesn't mean that they don't matter at all. It's that they're not really that important in the grand scheme of things. And I think, I, as I was thinking about this, I knew I was going to preach today. I've been thinking about kind of the season I wasn't going to miss the easy softball opportunity to talk about the new year. Um, so, uh, but I've been spending some time thinking about it, and the, the truth that we can find in that, that statistic that most people abandon their, their New Year's resolution within the first month is that change is hard. And I don't think, I, in Midwestern, I don't think very many people move to Aberdeen or grow up in Aberdeen and they stick around because they really love change and being on the cutting edge of culture. Aberdeen likes to stay the same. The Midwest, we like to keep things the same a lot of times. And so I think, I think I'm preaching to the choir when I say change is hard and we don't really like it. Um, but the kind of change that we're satisfied with making is pretty surface level, pretty superficial. And I think that that's telling uh, really about the culture that we live in. Uh, most of us uh, are kind of a part of this. I th would you agree with me when I say that our culture is pretty self-absorbed and it's pretty obsessed with self-image? Can we agree with that? The social media age has changed everything. Uh, just a, a few stats. I like stats. So uh, TikTok, anyone ever heard of it? I talked about it. Everyone laughs. Uh, I, I have TikTok, I think. Uh, I talked about it. I was up here a little while ago. We talked about youth ministry, kind of gave a state of youth ministry. I'm pretty sure most everyone in the youth group has TikTok. Um, there may be even be some kids. I don't know. Maybe some kids have TikTok as well. Uh, I didn't really understand it. I'm not, I, I actually am pretty tech savvy, but when it comes to social media, I'm not very good at it. Uh, if, you follow, if you're a follower of me or I'm friends with you or something like that, uh, you probably notice I don't post very much, I, really ever. Um, I'm not good with it. But TikTok this year in 2021 reached their billionth account. So there are over a billion people around the globe that are on TikTok and it's growing uh, astronomically. It's only been in existence for I think a few years absolutely exploded. The top Instagram influencer, if you don't know what a social media influencer is, it's pretty much just somebody that literally gets famous because they're on social media. Typically, it has something to do with them being really good looking uh, or something along those lines, something superficial. But the top Instagram influencer, they make $1.9 million every post, and that's an average. So they've made more than that. But every time they post, whether it's through you know, advertisement, sponsorships, or whatever it may be, they make $1.9 million. You and I, I'm pretty sure, are in the wrong business. We should all be striving. No, we shouldn't be striving to be that. But that just shows you where culture 
that what culture values. $382 billion spent annually on cosmetics. That's obviously makeup, but that also could be, um, I, I kind of looked at the details of that. That also includes health supplements. That could be even protein powder, whatever it is that, you know, you're trying to get huge um, or you're trying to look your prettiest or your most handsome. Uh, $382 billion spent on that annually in the, just in the United States. $380 billion spent on clothing. That's any sort of, you know, shoes, any apparel. Uh, so, I mean, it doesn't take very long to get up to that trillion dollar marker that we as, you, as Americans, proud Americans, uh, waste our money every single year on these things. Uh, my wife tells me all the time I have too many clothes. It's kind of weird. I'm probably more the girl in our relationship. I have more clothes than her. I actually am being very vulnerable saying that because for a couple of reasons. One, I make the argument that I don't have more clothes. My clothes are just bigger than hers because I'm a lot bigger than she is. But the true, it's probably true. I probably do have more clothes than her. Um, I think we all probably, I don't know if you got socks or, or maybe a new shirt or a new jacket over this Christmas season, but we, we can't get enough of our clothes. We are obsessed with ourselves. And even if we, uh, maybe we're not as obsessed as your, your, maybe you're an average person or for sure not the extremes, but I think we'd be lying to ourselves if we, we think that we're not affected by this reality of culture. If we really think that we're not that materialistic or we're way better than the rest of the world, I, I think we're kind of kidding ourselves. In reality, most of us are more passionate about our political party or we're more passionate about our favorite football team or our favorite band or whatever it may be than we are actually about being real, authentic followers of Jesus. And I am absolutely guilty of this. I, wanted, I want you to know when I was preparing for this sermon, uh, I was very challenged. I had a, diff- a little bit different idea. You'll notice in your bulletin it says identity. And we are going to talk about identity, but as I was, I was kind of uh, reading through Scripture and kind of praying and asking God what he wanted me to share with, I felt like what he wanted me to share with you today was what I'm struggling with, uh, what I've struggled with the past couple of years. And I think I would just, I'm not certain but I'd imagine that my struggles might look a little bit like your struggles too. So it affects the way, when we buy into this materialistic surface level culture uh, of external change, we're actually buying into a lot deeper idea of how change actually happens. And so I I wanna unpack two main lies that we believe before we get into our scripture today. We're actually gonna look specifically at the life of the apostle Paul today um, in, in a decent amount of detail, but there's two typical models that we will, will, as human beings, kind of go to. And there's two lies within these, these uh, models of change or, or identity um, that we'll, uh, we'll kind of look at. So the first one is doubling down on the external. So when we focus on trying to just make external changes by, uh, you know, being more disciplined, maybe being more organized, I, not, I, I believe that probably not all of your New Year's resolutions are something, you know, ex- completely vain. Maybe you do genuinely want to be a better person. But what we, what we find is that when we focus more on external change, maybe it's even changing a job. Maybe it's you want to get a new job because the, the environment that you work in is toxic. Or maybe, maybe you um, are looking just to kind of change your friend group because a lot of the friends that you have, the relationships that you have are pretty toxic. Well, the reality is external change, it can, it can make some change. It's, it's not like it doesn't exist. But when it comes to deep, meaningful, long-lasting change, uh, it's not, it's going to fail you. Uh, and maybe you've experienced this in your life. I know I have for sure. Uh, the Apostle Paul actually talks about this a little bit in Romans chapter 1, verse 22 and 23. And he talks, he's talking about the, the Gentile world. He was known as the missionary to the apostle for the Gentiles. We are all Gentiles. Um, well, most likely most of us are Gentiles, or all of us are Gentiles. Uh, but, but what he says in, in Romans chapter one, he's talking about the fault of all nations, the fault of the whole world, how we're all guilty. And he says that we trade the glory of the immortal God, so we trade an eternal perspective for temporary things, and the result of that is that people start making idols out of the things that they surround themselves with. So, so the challenge is, it's not if, it's when. When you try to make an external change in your life, it's not if, that thing will become an idol in your life. It's a matter of time. When will that thing become what is most important to you? When will that idol rule your life? So we are worshiping not just when we sing songs. We're not praising God just with our lips, but we praise God with our bank accounts, with every small action that we make 
in our lives. And so really what this actually leads you down is it leads you down a path where you're trying to maybe be a better person so that, you know, God will love you more. Uh, That's a false gospel, one. But two, you don't actually experience that freedom and change. You don't become a nicer person. You don't become just uh, a better looking person or more attractive to everybody simply because you may become more attractive if you dedicate. I'm, I'm not saying you don't get prettier if you work out or whatever or better looking if you work out. Obviously, we know that's not true. We will see change, but we won't see long-lasting change, and we won't fill that void that we feel inside. But here's the problem. It's not just external change that fails us. It's also internal change. So there's this lie that our culture tells us and that we really do believe in. It's that we are the, 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 the controllers of our own destinies, that if we work hard, that we can shape our identity, that we can that we can make change in our life and we can pull ourselves up from our bootstraps. I never have understood that metaphor, how you can pull yourself up from your bootstraps, but maybe someone did it one time. They're a lot stronger, definitely more fit than I am. Uh, But internal change is impossible on our own. So it's not a self-help industry. I don't know if any of you, there's, I know there's at least some young people in here that are like me. They actually like uh, something called the Enneagram. It's really blown up over the last, I don't know, a few years. I do enjoy it. I'm just as he has any millennial for falling for any uh, self-help. I like to think that I'm, oh, I'm resistant to that, but I always end up falling for it later, sooner or later. The self-help industry is a $10 billion annual industry in the United States. People buy books. They'll take a test. They'll, they'll do whatever they can to find that secret sauce, to find out, to make them, uh, to truly discover who they're meant to be, who you really are, so that you can experience deep, meaningful change all within yourself. You hold, you actually possess this truth deep inside of you that if you just access and unlock, then all of your life will be different. That's not true. And let me show you just one simple, one simple example of how we know that that's not true. And that really, this idea of finding identity within ourselves is completely incoherent. So how many of you remember when you were 15? No offense, I'm gonna kind of dog on 15 year olds. So if you're 15 and you're in here, I'm sorry. If you're 16, everyone, if you're patient, everyone will get dogged on. But how many of you remember when you were 15? Show of hands. I need a little participation. Good. Okay, how many of you remember when you first took that step out of, assuming uh, you remember when you are 15, you probably remember when you were 20. Uh, so you step in, out of your teen years into being uh, an adult. You're 20 years old. And you look back at, at five years ago, uh, your total immature 15-year-old self, and you kind of think to yourself, that you're pretty much an idiot, right? I know I was. I remember thinking that. Um, and then you get to 25, five years down the road, and you look back at yourself, your 20-year-old self, and again, you were pretty much just an idiot then. And then you get maybe a little bit further down the road to 35-year-old self. You look back at your 25-year-old self, and you, again, were just pretty much an idiot. And this cycle continues. Do you see what, do you see what I'm getting at? You are all idiots right now. I'm an idiot too. We're all idiots. We're all idiots. And we're going to see, be able to look back on our lives today if we live long enough to see that, oh, we were just an idiot then too. So this idea that you can find this deep, meaningful change from somewhere deep inside you is a joke. Now we see this play out in an extreme way in, in the world today where young people are being lied to, not just young people, but in specifically young, immature, idiot 15-year-olds, no offense, are, are being taught this lie that their true identity can be found in exploring who they are sexually. And, and this, is, this is an extreme case of exactly what I'm talking about. But it's really, really easy for us to look at that and then be like, I, see, that's the, that's the crazy people. Those are the people that have real identity issues. And then assume that you're just fine because you're not sh- struggling with the most extreme uh, kinds of identity crisis. The reality is we're guilty of thinking this exact same thing. Paul even alludes to this a little bit in chapter 7 of Romans. Uh, So just a little bit after he's talking about the guilt, he's actually continuing to talk about how we at our core are sinful human beings. And he says this, I do not understand what I do for what I want to do. I do not do, but what I hate, I do. Now, that sound, if that sounded like word soup or some sort of uh, riddle, uh, it sounds like that to me too. So I'm going to break it down a little bit. I do not understand what I do. So what he's, he's pointing to this internally, he can't figure out why he does the things that he does. 
We can't fully understand our motivations. We want to, we want to, but we can't. And so he says, for, I, for what I want to do, I do not do. What he's saying is, what I want to do is I don't want to sin, but I, don't, I, I can't help myself. I cannot help myself from sinning. And the reason is, sin is not just some external force. Evil absolutely exists, and it exists in our world in an external form, and we see it manifested in awful ways. We've seen in the 20th century some of the absolute worst atrocities, human atrocities that hum- hum- humanity's ever seen in the history of the world. But, but it stems not from this external force that's somewhere else. It stems from right inside of our very hearts. That heart that, you, that you're being told can help change who you, who you see yourself as actually is just going to find another vice for you to make an idol of and never actually experience change other than further and further and further sin. So what's the solution? <laughs> I, 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 I've only preached three times here, and I feel like every, I kind of felt a little guilty. Rodney's really good at kind of like, you know, throwing a few. He's pretty funny. He throws a few softballs and just kind of gets you going. I actually have a hard time with that because I just kind of come out the gate hitting pretty hard. And so I apologize for that, but I can't help it because this is, this is serious stuff and it's real to me. And I'm, I'm really, I'm struggling with this just as much as any of you are. But it can look kind of hopeless. The solution can look kind of hopeless. If we can't experience real change by just changing our environment or our external lives, or we can't experience change by just diving deeper inside of ourselves and finding out our motivations, then where are we really left? Well, the truth is obviously that there is hope but it's a hope that does exist outside of ourselves. But um, we're, we're gonna get to what change actually looks like and what God is calling you and myself to, the kind of change, the deep, meaningful change that lasts a lot longer than a New Year's resolution. But before we get there, what I wanna do is I wanna look at one of the most radical transformations that uh, this earth maybe has ever seen, for sure that we see in scripture. And uh, we see someone go from uh, the, uh, the utmost sinner of all sinners to one of the most influential people in the history of the church, for sure, in the New Testament, and that is the Apostle Paul. So we're going to start by talking a little bit about his life. Um, so Paul was actually, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of people in here that know a lot about the Apostle Paul. So the reason that I'm going through this is, one, even if you know this, it's important to be reminded of it, but I don't want to assume that everyone in this room knows all of the intimate details of Paul's life, I know for sure I didn't, and so I, and, and for me, this was very, very moving. And so I don't want to withhold the blessing of looking at the life of, of one of the fathers of our faith and seeing how we actually look like Paul or Saul a lot in our own lives. So bear with me as we get through this. Uh, Saul was born actually just a few years after Jesus would have been born. So he would have been probably anywhere, they, they don't really know for sure, but he would probably have been between five and eight years younger than Jesus. He was born uh, just straight north of him geographically. Uh, He was born in what is modern day Turkey. Uh, Paul was born into an educated middle class family. They were a part of the Pharisee movement or the Pharisaical movement. Now we use Pharisee as pretty much a derogatory term, uh, the same way that they would have used the term uh, Nazarite because Nazarites were, you know, like lowly people. They were kind of no good. Some probably like, you know, we're from South Dakota. Let's be real. We all kind of, it's like, oh, Leola. You know, we all have that, right? Oh, Mobridge. I'm from Mobridge, so I can kind of dog on Mobridge people because um, I am one. But, uh, but, but at the time, Paul would have been born into decent means. Uh, he was educated, but he was also blue collar. Uh, Pharisees at, their, at this time actually um, were, were rising um, as kind of a movement that actually push, pushed back against the cultural elite. So the Sadducees were actually uh, the establishment. They would have been what we would consider the establishment. And, and Pharisees actually looked a lot like what we are. They looked a lot like kind of conservative evangelicals. And, and even though they had, uh, they had kind of what would be for the time been considered liberal theology, what that means is they, they actually believed that uh, through the law that was given to us through Moses, uh, that we can actually evaluate our world and we can make laws and that help us to become more profitable, help us to become better people, um, and that if you work hard enough that you can become a better person and earn God's favor. Well, that is what we call a classic example of the prosperity gospel. So 
they actually believed what a lot of evangelicals today or people that would be associated with evangelical Christianity uh, believe as well. So we actually look a lot like Paul. He's, he's a relatable figure. He was elected at a very young age to be one of uh, uh, 10 people that were on what was called the Sanhedrin. So they were like the, the elite. They made the rules. And any of the rules that these 10 men made, they went out to all of Israel and, and they became laws. So they, that's how they saw a, a trickle down, basically. You, sh- you, uh, you shape the law and people obey the law and culture is changed. And if this, if this doesn't sound familiar to you, then you maybe haven't been awake for the last couple of years uh, politically. But, but this, is, this is very, should be very relatable to you and I. We live in a very similar world. We think very similarly to the way that these Pharisees thought. He was elected by his uh, teacher, uh, Gamaliel, I think is how you would say it. So Gamaliel actually was one of the most prominent teachers of Judaic law at the time. So he was well-educated. Um, he, he came from, he worked with his hands, so he wasn't just a bum. We would have liked him. Odds are, we would have liked him. And then what you see is Paul takes this, or Saul takes this shift, uh, makes this major shift in his life where uh, there's this movement uh, that actually starts to kind of push back against the movement, the pharisaical movement. And it was uh, this guy named Jesus who not only claimed to be rabbi, but he claimed to be God, which completely shook the fabric of the Judaic society. Um, it, it actually, they believed and they were looking to the Messiah, but the people of this time weren't looking for a Messiah to actually be God. They were looking for a political leader. They were looking to somebody to save them out of their Roman occupation. They were looking for someone to establish a new political norm so that they could live lives of abundance and happiness and pleasure. And so this threatened, this, uh, this threatened the fabric. And Saul, we see this moment in the, in the book of Acts where we, the first martyr of a, a Christian is committed. So martyr, for those of you who don't know, is someone who dies for the cause of Christ. Um, any of you that would die as a result of persecution would be considered a martyr. So martyrs still exist today. People die every day for the sake of the cause of, God's, of Jesus Christ's gospel. So he killed the first martyr. His name was Stephen, and they stoned him to death because Stephen walked through in front of the Sanhedrin, called before the Sanhedrin, walked through the ministry of the gospel, started with the creation of human beings through, through Abraham, through Moses, and into basically where they were at, called them out for what they really were, which, which were basically shills who claimed to be close to God but were far from them and cared way more about political activism than they did real heart change, and they killed him for it. So Paul then, we see the, or Saul in his life, we see this shift to where then he starts persecuting uh, Christians. He becomes actually the leader of this group that's rounding Christians up, pulling them out of their home, throwing them in prison. And if you went to prison at this time, likelihood of you dying, the average age was like 35, 40 years old, you were likely gonna die. Prison was not a good place. And so I, I want you to get this image in your mind. Maybe, hopefully none of you have killed anybody before, um, you know, in, a, in an illegal way, manner. If you have killed someone, I, you're probably a genius. You committed a perfect murder and you're sitting amongst us. So I, I, I don't believe that we have any, gen- no offense, I don't believe we have any uh, secret geniuses that are, have killed a lot of people. But, uh, but I think it can be easy at this point to say like, okay, Saul's in a new category now. I don't relate to him. I'm not similar to him. But we do this on a day-to-day basis in our hearts. Scripture tells us that if if you hate somebody in your heart, you've already committed murder. And so it's semi-irrelevant the fact that he actually threw a stone because we all know in our hearts, we throw stones at people's heads all the time. So Saul um, starts ripping people out of their homes they, they pass a law making it illegal. He's on his way up to the northern kingdom to release this decree so that people know Christianity's outlawed and he's gonna start doing the same thing there. They, they pick him to do that. On this road to Damascus, Jesus appears to him, strikes him blind. He has a radical conversion. He's blind for three days, which is extremely significant. If you remember how many days Jesus died um, was, was in the grave before he rose, three days. If you look to the story of Jonah, who was by far 
the, the, he was the opposite of who Jesus was. He was in the belly of a whale for three days. Paul, or Saul at this time, suffered blindness for three days in darkness before Ananias, a follower and believer of Jesus, touches him, heals him, and Paul is radically changed. Saul is radically changed from this point and now he gets a new name and becomes Paul. Now we look at, I, I'm not exaggerating when I say this, that Paul is literally the most influential person in the history of Christianity besides Jesus. It's a fact, for us especially. He changed the world. He changed everything. He began a ministry where he started planting churches in all of these different places and literally did a, a complete 180, going from persecuting, being the chief proponent for persecution, then becomes the chief proponent for spreading the gospel. We, we, a lot of the practices that we have here at New Life are a result of him. He wrote 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament. Paul is absolutely the second most influential person in the history of the church. Now let's analyze real quick Paul's transformation before we jump into some scripture that he wrote. Paul was not walking on the road to Damascus or riding or whatever he was doing and thinking about, you know, like, well, it's New Year, new me. I've been pretty rude to a lot of Christians these days. Maybe I should back off a little bit. I mean, they're really a headache for me, but... Maybe I could just kind of cut him some slack. Maybe I'll stop throwing rocks at their head. Um, he didn't start searching deep within himself to be like, man, you know, I've really been struggling with anger. I just need to change my surroundings so that I, I don't, only positive vibes, and that will, that will change my heart so then I start to really love these Christians because, I mean, they're bad, but they're not that bad. No, it took a miracle to change Paul's life. It took for Paul to realize that the very person that he killed, that he approved to be put on that cross, died because he loved Paul so much. And he wanted to see his life changed so that he could see others' lives changed as well. This is what happens. Change, deep change comes from the outside and it points us directly inside, but it points us to our insufficiencies. It points us to the darkness of our heart. It points us to our sinful souls. So I'm gonna read two verses. I wanna unpack these verses. We're gonna, we're gonna continue on through, but these first two verses are very enlightening, seeing how Paul's vision shifts. Okay, so in verse 16, you can turn there now if you'd like to. It's uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 through 21. It's gonna be on the screen. It starts saying this. From now on then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective. Even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective, yet now we no longer know him in this way. And Paul was really smart, and he, even though he used plain common language at the time, he can be kind of confusing to understand for sure for me, so I have to spend a lot of time reading and rereading and rereading and then finding out what other people think. But what he's saying here is from now on then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective. What he's saying is, we don't see people based on the external anymore. When we look at people, we see them for who God sees them as. He says, even if we know Christ from a worldly perspective, what he did, how he shook the fabric of their community, how he changed the status quo, we no longer see him as just a mere good leader or just a good teacher. We see him for who he really is, the son of God, the savior that we all needed. He sees him as our righteousness. So I just want to challenge you. I, I'm going to be a little bit vulnerable with you this morning. Part of the reason I wanted to go this direction is because I have been struggling with the sin of, of uh, anger. <laughs> I actually am kind of an angry person. Um, when I get really tired, I, I require, I'm a baby. I require a lot of sleep um, in order to have a good attitude. And I, I, have, I told Rodney last night, we had a wedding here, and I, I, I was talking to him just about how, man, I just am struggling with not being mean to people, you know, whether it's my wife or just kind of people like, even if I'm not outwardly mean to them, inside, I get pretty mean <laughs> in my head. And I don't know if that's relatable, um, <clears throat> but, uh, but I, I told Rod, man, I just think I need, a, I need to get away just for a little bit, you know. And how many of you, I, it's funny, I, I thought about it last night after I said that. I'm like, wow, that is like the most hypocritical thing for me to say after now I'm going to go, change is not an external thing, guys. 
It's internal and it's from the outside in. Well, the reality is I, I struggle with this too. How many of you have gone on a, like, I need a vacation so bad, and then you go on a vacation, and that vacation ends up being, maybe it's not super glamorous, but like you, you end up just getting away, go shopping a little bit, and then you come back actually more tired than before you left, and you're like, well, that whole idea of, man, if I just got away and come back, I'd be refreshed, that didn't really work. <laughs> that relatable? There's a reason for that, and the reason is because that's not how we change. That's not the cure to our problem. How many of you spent a lot of time in 2020 and 2021 complaining or talking bad about the opposing political beliefs? Thank you. Vulnerable people. Yes. Ditto. Ditto. I told Rod in 2020, at the end of it, I was like, man, Rod, I don't think I've ever said the word idiot more than in 2020. And then 2021 hit, and then I told Rod again, man, I don't think I've ever said the word idiot more than I said it in 2021. And I did a lot of, the truth is 2020, we didn't even see each other for a lot of it. So it definitely wasn't a result of external environment. But I've been struggling with this and, and there's a real threat right now that's weighing on the church. And that threat is when you spend a lot of time criticizing the, op, the opposing belief system, the opposing political system, and inside you continue to think, idiot, idiot, idiot. What you're doing is you're making an enemy of your mission field. I have spent two years making an enemy of my mission field. And it's affected me in a real profound way. And I would just guess, based on at least one vulnerable hand that was raised and the laughs that followed, that you're in a similar place as me. And that even though maybe I haven't chucked a rock at someone's head and killed them, I've thought it would be kind of fun. Or I've thought that, man, maybe that wouldn't be the worst thing for them. In verse 17, Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Everything is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. I want to pause on this idea of reconciliation. What does reconciliation mean? I'm glad that you don't know because I'm gonna tell you because I looked it up. Reconciliation, I think you probably know. But to be reconciled means that there's a problem. It points to the fact that there's there's an issue. So if I um, got mad at Pastor Rodney, which never ever happens, ever. If I got mad at Pastor Rodney because I didn't like that he was copying my wardrobe or something like that, and I was like, you know, he just dresses like me now because he thinks I'm cool, and I get that I should be flattered by it, but it just annoys me. And then I start talking bad about him behind his back, and then soon he catches wind about it, and then he's like, Greg thinks he's so cool, but real, in reality, I started dressing this way, and he's copying me. And then they start, we, we both start talking smack behind each other's backs, and, and we kind of, you know, it kind of, we, we get to the point where I'm going to have to quit my job because he's stealing my, he's stealing my, you know, my, whatever you call this, my drip. That's what the young kids call it. And, 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 uh, and so then we, we have this moment where we get together and we start talking about it and we're like, you know what? We need to put our differences aside. And when I say differences, I mean similarities. It's ridiculous how similar we dress, but, but we need to put this aside because this is silly. And what we then at that moment, we hug it out and we're like, you know what, it's okay. What we are doing is we are being reconciled in that moment. And so when, when Paul tells us that everything is from God who has reconciled us, what he's saying is he has made a way so that we can be made right, so that we don't have to have strife between God, so that we don't have to face condemnation, so that we don't have to think about all of the stuff that we've done over the course of our lives and how bad we've messed up our lives and how we are irredeemable. What we can do is we can look in the mirror and we can see, yes, a person that's flawed, yes, a person that is sinful, but a person that has been dramatically saved 
by someone who loves them even deeper and even more unconditional than we can ever begin to imagine. Not only that, though, but that Paul says he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And so this is what I want to get at today. If we leave with nothing else, this is the most important thing that I will say. If you have been reconciled to God and you are following Jesus and yet you are not loving your neighbor and you are not making disciples of all nations and you are not being what Paul will call in just a little bit later an ambassador to God, if you are not about the ministry of reconciliation, then you are not following God. This is a harsh reality. This is why it's so serious, guys. This is why I've been struggling so much. It's because I messed up. And ultimately, as a leader in this church, one of the leaders in this church, I'm not truly following Jesus if I can't love my neighbor, if I can't be patient with somebody, if I can't help but choose someone out because they're such an idiot and I've got it all figured out. Are we truly following Jesus or are we just masking the messed up person we are with wearing decent clothes, making sure our, our hair looks all right, going out to work and putting on a smile and, and just living our life, masking what really is just messed up on the inside. God gave you his righteousness as we see in verse 21. He says, he made the one who did not know any sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It is not your righteousness. No matter how good you may look on the outside, no matter how nice you may be, everyone in town may think you are the nicest person. And you could be an empty vessel inside. You could be completely hollow and struggling with anger and frustration at your emptiness. You see, an ambassador is really just a disciple. Those words could be used interchangeably. We're ambassadors to Christ. We, we look at, we spend a lot of time, you know, what's our goal here? Like, we want to make disciples of all nations. We want to go, well, that's why we've got campuses in Peru. That's why I've got a couple campuses here. We've been trying to, you know, be on the reservation. We've been all over the place, where, and we want to continue to make disciples of all nations. But in reality, a disciple is not just someone who recognizes their own sinfulness and then goes, well, Jesus loves me, though, so I can lift my head up and walk out the door and feel better about myself. Is that a piece of it? For sure. But he made us to be ambassadors. Being a disciple is being a follower of Jesus, but it's also being an ambassador. It's being his ambassador. What does an ambassador do? They advocate for the good of the country that they represent. We have ambassadors all over the world. They advocate for the, the, the good of us citizens who reap the benefits of living in the greatest country in the world. And they do it at the penalty sometimes of their lives. They do it and they're, they're expected to act out of, not out of self-interest, but out of the interest of every other self that belongs to their nation. That is exactly what we are called to do. You were bought with a price, and so it doesn't matter how annoying someone is, it doesn't matter how stupid someone is, it doesn't matter how, how much smarter you are than somebody else. You were called to reach the lost, the lowly. You were called to reach those people that you completely disagree with politically. Are you making an enemy of your mission field or do you really believe what Jesus says and do you really believe in the ministry of reconciliation? There's three, three easy steps for 1999 that I wanna sell you at this point. No, there's three simple things. I've been harping on this with the youth group. I've been, I see a lot of the youth kids, they look a lot like I did when I was their age and it's not that I wasn't a good kid. I was probably actually the poster child of being a good kid. I was a pastor's kid. Everyone was like, oh, Greg, he's such, you know, I, I'm sure most people, anyone that had something bad on me, they either were my sister or my parents. And I, I was a pretty good, I was a pretty good kid. But the problem is, is that's not the ministry that we're in. We're not in the ministry of raising good kids. We're in the ministry of making disciples. Whether those are our kids, there's someone else's kids, they're our neighbors, our coworkers, whoever they are, our parents. And so there's three things that all disciples need in order to experience change, but actually to belong to what we call the kingdom of God, the family of God. And these are the three things. They combat 
the, the lies of the enemy, the identity that our culture is trying to push on you, these are your weapons, okay? So the first one is this. It'll pop up on your screen. You can fill it in your blank. We all need truth. Could it be possible that the year 2022 is the year that you get serious about diving into God's word? We are without any excuse. How many of you have one of these? It's a joke, right? We all have them. It has never been easier to access God's word. You can literally download the U version of the Bible and you'll have at your fingertips the ability to download hundreds of translations, thousands of, of Bible studies. You can even connect with your friends, whether it's, through, it's integrated through Facebook, Instagram, a couple different things. You can connect with all sorts of other disciples in this very room. I may even be friends with you, some of you on your Bible app. But I've talked to Pastor Rodney and all the other pastors and I really believe, we agree as a team that one of the things that we wanna see is groups who are invested in reading and engaging with God's word start at our church and it's never been easier. You don't even have to meet in a room. You don't have to get around a, a, a physical paper Bible, although if you don't have one, we'd love for you to take one that's underneath one of the seats. You can do it from wherever you're at. If you're online right now or you're downtown, you can do the exact same thing from wherever you're at. We are absolutely without excuse. Let me, it's not just my opinion. Let me read a couple scriptures for you. 1 John 1, 8 says this, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. One of the repercussions of not being in God's word is that we become immune to the idea that we are sinful. We don't think that we need God's word because we don't really think that we're struggling. I'm, I've been there, okay? I guarantee you every single pastor that's on staff has been there. It's not just a, a you know, average Joe problem. It, it is a pervasive problem for everybody. Ephesians 6, 14 says, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place. The belt of truth is God's word. John 4, 24 says, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. When we sing, we sing in that song, your praise be ever be on my lips, we're not just talking about singing songs. We're talking about worshiping, yes, in spirit, being together, joining our hearts together, but also in this ministry of remembering God's truth, which is how we know about Jesus. It's what we test all problems and, and obstacles that we face in our life against. It is how we know God. 2022 be the year that you get serious about being in God's word. The second thing is this. We all need mutual accountability. This one's a little bit harder, I think, because you can't just be mutually accountable with yourself. That was kind of a joke, but it's also serious. We all need mutual accountability. What does that mean? It means you might need a relationship with somebody that can get uncomfortable with you and call you out when you're wrong. Now, what we call that a majority of the time is a jerk, right? I think that's kind of what we identify with, the idea of someone calling you out. It's like, oh, I just, I just left my home. I got, I'm finally not having to listen to my dad tell me what to do. Now you're telling me I got to go find someone else to bark orders at me? Yes, <laughs> on some level. We all need someone in our lives. Maybe it's a spouse. Maybe it's a brother or a sister. Maybe it's just a close friend. Maybe it's someone that right now is a stranger to you, but you threw uh, this this family that we have here at New Life, you find someone that can hold you accountable just as well as you can hold them accountable. This is a scriptural mandate. 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 12 26 through 27 says, if one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. This the world hates, absolutely hates. This idea that you are not a individual who self-defines as this, the world hates that. We, they completely reject it. And if they're honest with themselves, that is why the world hates Jesus. That is why the world crucified Jesus. Because we like ourselves. No matter how bad we may think of ourselves sometime or how down we get on ourselves, the reason we get down is because we love ourselves and we, have, we hold ourselves in high esteem. 
You are a part of the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. You are not whole on your own. You need others in your life. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, it's probably the most famous talking about mutual accountability. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. We are called to sharpen one another. We are called to challenge one another and we're never going to be good enough to challenge ourselves because we have blinders on. Spiritual blinders. We are blind to our hearts and the motives of our hearts. James 5.16 says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. We like that second part. We don't necessarily like the first part, do we? We like to know that prayers prayers are heard, uh, that if you're righteous, if you are in Christ and his righteousness covers you, that your prayers are heard. We don't like the idea of confessing sin. And I would say that maybe we even look at those as, as contradictory statements. Well, how can you confess your sin if you're you know, righteous? The reality is you will always sin. Sin will always be a burden that you bear. There's a famous theologian that said, if you don't get about the business of killing your sin, sin will kill you. And if you are on the cusp of 2022 and you're feeling heavy, for a whole nother year of political turmoil, a whole nother year of thinking everyone's an idiot. It doesn't have to be that way. The final thing is I think the, one of the most difficult things for us, uh, this is our last thing, and we're gonna pray in close, sing one more song. This is actually, I think, the hardest thing for this culture that we live in. Uh, we live in a good old boy culture called the Midwest. I've grown up, I've lived uh, in the Midwest my whole life. I did not always from South Dakota. I lived in Missouri for a while. We all share very similar values, even though obviously South Dakota is way better than Missouri. No offense to anyone who's in here that might be from Missouri or tuning in online. South Dakota is way better. Even though there's a 150 degree swing, you know, within a month of each other, you know, it's, that's a little bit annoying. We struggle, not necessarily with being accountable because we like our status quo. You don't move to Aberdeen because you want to see great change and it's such a progressive culture. You like Aberdeen because it doesn't change, as you said before. And so being open and transparent and vulnerable is the real challenge that we have. So the truth is, is we all need transparent vulnerability. And that may look different for each one of us, but we don't real really see change in our hearts without first being honest about the fact that we might not know our heart. We don't see real change without first being opened up. And in some cases, the way that God opens us up is he takes us through pain. He takes us through suffering. Maybe it's, maybe the loss of a loss of a loved one or the reminder of a loss of a loved one over this holiday season has really ripped you up inside. Maybe you're angry not just at people, but you're angry at God. The answer to your problem is to be open to the fact that that suffering, that hurt that you experience may be the answer and the key that opens you up and helps you to come to a saving relationship with Jesus. You are not good enough on your own. And it's actually this very thing, being open and vulnerable with one another, that, Paul, that uh, we, we see in the Gospel of John, that Jesus says is the mark of how people will know who we are. In John chapter 13, verse 35, it says, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. We will be known by the way that we love, not by the opinions that we hold. It doesn't mean that we don't make judgment calls. It doesn't mean that we don't judge sin. It doesn't mean that we don't have opinions and that we don't vote. The answer is not to become completely apolitical. The answer is not to completely disengage from society and just be kind of, you know, in la-la land or this, this kind of spiritual nirvana. The answer is we pull up our sleeves and we love one another despite how much we may struggle with that person. Are you making an enemy in 2022 of your mission field or are you responding to the call of reconciling the world? Your identity can change from understanding this one simple truth, that Jesus became sin who knew no sin so that you and I 
may be called righteous. Do you know him this new year? Let's bow, let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for this opportunity to, to speak, to dive into your word. God, we, uh, I, I truly pray that 2022 would be a year marked by iron sharpening iron. God, would you, would you crack us open in whatever way you see fit? God, would you humble hearts? Would you, would you make people so discontent with the way that things are in their life, the anger, the frustration, the hurt, the bitterness, that these difficult times and frustrating times that we live in, these times where we're not seeing, in the name of justice, we're seeing injustice. God, would you remind us that we weren't just called to be saved so that we can have a happy life. We were called and bought with a price so that we may take up our cross and join you in your suffering. God, would you make us fearless through the power of your Holy Spirit? God, I know that there's people in this room that do not actually know you, that do not have a personal relationship with you, that maybe are interested in in changing a few things externally about themselves, maybe even looking at their, their heart a little bit, but they're not interested in admitting the fact that they are sinful. They're not interested in looking at themselves as the core of the problem. God, would you break us? Would you, would you change our hearts and would we leave this place not the same? Would this year be the year that's marked by truth? Would this be the year that's marked by mutual accountability and by vulnerability, transparent vulnerability, God? Would we become a new creation, not just in lip service, but in deed and in transformed heart? We pray this in the powerful name, the only name that can change anything, and that is Jesus. And we pray this in your name. And all God's people said, amen. Thanks so much for joining us today. We pray this message connected with you, and we hope it gave you another way to connect with Jesus and your New Life family. For more ways to get plugged in here at New Life, you can visit our website at www.newlifeaberdeen.org. Thanks again for listening and have a great week.